The first thing is to realize that the, in the internet, like in any computer network, we want, we transform packet or bit errors into packet losses. And then once there are packet losses due to transmission errors or true losses due to overflow in queues, the question is where to repair it, how and when to repair it. There are essentially two ways to do it. It can be done hop by hop, which is illustrated here, or on the hop by hop is here, or end to end. Hop by hop means, well, assume this packet is lost, P3 is sent over uh, some MAC layer mechanism. If I do the end-to-end -end retransmission, which is what I do with TCP, here you recognize TCP, I will detect that the packet is missing when something happens uh, here, and then I might, so here I'm showing an abstract thing, packet 3 is missing. In fact, it will, it's all the bells and whistles of TCP that will detect it, and then we'll retransmit it. We could do the same thing locally. I send a packet to a router, the router doesn't receive it, then I detect that this is missing and I retransmit it. Here we detect end-to-end -end and repair end-to-end. -end. Here we detect locally and repair locally. Which is, be which is better? In general, in life, it's better to solve local problems locally. Uh, that's a general rule of complex systems. If you have a problem in ATPFL, you don't want to make it a worldwide problem. It's better to solve it locally. Here. However, in the internet, there is one of the internet principles that has to do with many layers. is called the end-to-end -end principle. We will come back to it when we study the application layer. But the internet was really designed around this principle, which says, essentially, that the network doesn't go above the network layer, and anything that happens uh, above the network layer should be handled end-to-end. -end. For example, if I send, if I download some data from a server, there is no store and forward inside the network. I go directly to the server and through the routers to the place where I will store the data, in principle. That's the end-to-end -end philosophy. So the end-to-end -end philosophy uh, implies in particular that the routers simply forward and the bridges simply forward packets and don't keep state about the flows that they are using. Mm -hmm. So that speaks in favor of doing end-to-end -end, um, end -end retransmission. And this is also illustrating uh, another reason for that. What did we see on this animation? Different paths. So here there would be no possibility, in fact, for R2 to know whether some packets are missing because they are lost. They were lost from R1 to R2, or because they simply will go some other way. So at least if we look at it in this way, it speaks in favor of doing things end to end. However, things are not as simple if we do a bit of information theory, uh, trivial information theory, or much simpler than what is done in a true information theory course. We can come to a different conclusion. So first, our simple information theory statement. Capacity of the erasure channel. So information theory is about computing capacities of channels, largely. Uh, if I have a channel that has a bit rate or a packet rate of r packets per second that drops a fraction p of the packets. What's the capacity of this channel? Well, the only difficult thing is to define capacity. Uh, capacity, intuitively, is meant as what is the rate at which you can convey information through this channel. Well, the answer is it's not exactly the rate, but it's an upper bound on the rate. You can approach the capacity uh, as close as you want. And the answer is the capacity is simply this trivial formula is the amount of data that is not lost, the rate of data that is not lost. R is how many packets per second are lost. 1 minus P is the fraction of those that are not lost. So over a period of time, you get through this channel R over 1 times 1 minus P. And then the information theory says that, well, 
we can approach this capacity if we code things well, and the way of coding is actually by doing TCP. If you, when something is detected missing, well, you retransmit it, and hopefully uh, you can be very efficient. So in practice, if I have a link of 10 megabit per second, I lose 10% of the packet, I could code arbitrarily close to 9 megabit per second on this. And we forget the arbitrary close because this is a computer science course, so we make things simpler. So armed, equipped with this information theory theorem, uh, let's compute the end-to-end -end capacity of something like this uh, when we do hop-by-hop -hop or end-to-end -end error recovery. So I'm assuming a simple scenario where I have K links that drop packets. I make things academically simple. There's the same loss probability, which is P. For some reason, the end of the P is missing. The same rate R packets per second are on the links. And I drop packets, make whatever assumption you want. You can assume the losses are independent. What is the end-to-end -end capacity of this link from A to B? Let's start by the case where we do hop by hop. Hop by hop means if a packet is lost between R2 and R3, which occurs for every packet with probability P, I will retransmit it from R2 to R3. Okay, I close in five seconds. And the correct answer is not the majority vote. The correct answer is number two. Oops. Why? Well, the capacity of, if I look at the capacity of one tube here, the link from R2 to R3, we've seen from our information theory theorem that it's R times 1 minus P. So over this link, I can approximately convey that much information, say 9 megabits per second. Now, if you have nine, if you have K tubes, that each of them has a capacity of 9 megabit per second, if you put them end to end, it's a piping problem, so civil engineering, the capacity is nine. But you can put into the first link nine megabits per second. Those nine megabits can also be forwarded by the second, etc. Of course, we ignore delay, that's the information theory uh, rule of the game. So the capacity of the concatenation of lossless segments is the mean of the capacity of the segments. This is a tube problem in water pipes. If you put them in series, you have the minimum capacity. That, therefore, that explains the answer. Now, perhaps if you did the other choice, is because you were thinking of the other case. With end-to-end -end recovery, what happens? Well, then one way to approach the problem is to look at the concatenation of, cans of uh, links as one link that has a given error probability. What's the error probability? Well, this is the small computation. Let me call it Q. The probability that a packet is lost is 1 minus the probability that it is not lost. Since the losses are assumed to be independent, the probability that a packet is not lost is equal to the probability of the event. It is not lost on the first, and not lost on the second, and not lost on the etc. 
and if they are truly independent, the probability is the product of the probability. So the probability of not being lost is 1 minus p to the power the number of links. So the capacity of the path is r min minus 1 minus q, so the 1 minus disappears, that gives this formula. So the formula that you picked is in fact the capacity of the end-to-end -end, uh, path. Why does it matter? Well, of course, when we do end-to-end, -end, if we lose a packet with probability 10% in every link, and if you go through 10 links, the probability that the packet is lost will be very large, in fact. So the capacity of the concatenation of links can become very small if you do end-to-end -end recovery. Here I'm showing an academic example where k equals 10, which is very decent in the internet. We've seen that the TTL is uh, usually larger than 10. If the packet loss is 5%, then if I use end-to-end -end recovery, I will have only 60% of the capacity of the link, which means the probability that something is lost uh, in a concatenation of 10 links is 40%. Whereas if I do hop by hop, of course, I will have 95%. So I lose only 5% of capacity. Voila. Well, that is a strong argument for the saying, well, we should do end to we should do hop, hop by hop error recovery. So how do we do? Now, again, we have the two. It's like with TCP fast retransmit. How do we combine those two conflicting requirements? How would you do it? Imagine for a second that you're working in the 70s. Not now. You have to design that stuff. So what would you do? Pardon me? Time out at the routers? Mm -hmm. But no, a any solution you do, I will criticize it. Because if you say I'm in favor of end-to-end -end packet loss recovery, I'll say, yeah, but uh, there is uh, this capacity problem. But if you're in favor of hop by hop, uh, well, we've seen also that makes the routers too complicated. Well, the solution is, uh, well, first, this capacity problem is an issue only if the loss rate is large. If we truly drop 5 or 10% of the packets, doing end-to-end -end error recovery will be catastrophic. This is what may happen, in fact, if you have concatenation of wireless links, then you might have very bad performance because you're repeating packets. And if you just do end-to-end -end recovery, it won't work well. So that's the, that's the key observation. There is a complexity penalty of doing hop-by-hop -hop recovery. You want to do it only at the places where the loss rate is high. So you want to design cable and transmission mechanisms that have, of course, as small a loss rate as possible. But in practice today, we are able to do this only on cable network or on wireless at very low bit rates. If you run Wi-Fi at 2 megabit per second, you will have practically zero packet loss. But if you run it at 100 or 50 megabit per second, you will have higher packet loss. Now, the price to pay to have zero packet loss is very large because you divide the capacity by a factor of 50 or 100. So you better to have, you prefer to have some losses. But then you need to handle them. So you will handle them, not in the routers, but at the MAC layer. So typically, a Wi-Fi base station will have acknowledgement. This is why there are acknowledgements and retransmission in the MAC layer of a wireless network. If a packet is lost in, uh, over a, a MAC uh, wireless link, in most cases, it will be retransmitted directly because there is something like TCP at the MAC layer where you send a packet, you start a timer. Sometimes even you have a window of packets that you can transmit. And then when a packet is detected that has lost at the MAC layer, you retransmit it. This is what Wi-Fi typically does. For the rest of, uh, and, and some cellular network will do the same thing. For the rest, well, you don't bother and you prefer to keep the router simple and do end-to-end -end packet error recovery. Voila, that's the end of uh, TCP and transport layer module. Any questions on that? Yes?
Yes, in this ac highly academic example, all the links are the same. Good, then we move to the next topic, which perhaps some of you who are fast in the homeworks have already had a glimpse of, which is multicast in lab, in the programming lab, in lab three, we ask you to uh, code uh, using IP multicast. So we need to discuss what this is and how it works. So while I'm struggling with uh, Windows, Microsoft, and Turning Point to start the multicast uh, module, um, okay. this is illustrating the design goal of IP multicast. Well, not, <laughs> not this one. This one. This is showing radio programs, TV programs. And here a small message that you could read on uh, one of those uh, streaming radio programs. Well, those guys are complaining that it costs them a lot to have this streaming infrastructure. So if they detect that you don't seem to be listening to, uh, to the program, they will cut you. Or more precisely, they will cut you so that uh, to force you to click again because they use an infrastructure of servers, a network of servers, uh, to stream the, their radio program. This is a public radio channel, doesn't have lots of money, so they don't want to do that. IP multicast was done to avoid this problem. With IP multicast, we send the data at the IP layer. And if I am a radio program streaming, I just, the source, as we will see, will just send one packet to millions of users. So things like Blue Wind TV use multicast. If you watch TV over the telecom networks of Switzerland, they will, in fact, deliver the TV channels to you over IP multicast. But if you watch Netflix, it will use streaming uh, servers, application layer multicast, as opposed to IP layer multicast. So what is IP multicast? IP multicast is the idea that we send data to a group of destinations. In particular, we have multicast addresses that are logical identifiers of groups. So the mental model is, if I am host one, and I send to a given multicast address, for example this one, 225.123, you recognize an IPv4 address, then all the hosts that belong to this group will receive the data. That's the essential idea, and the major benefit is that the send, on the sending side, you send only once and millions of devices receive. And the classical application is for TV and radio channel. It exists in IPv4 and IPv6. In IPv4, those are all the addresses that, are, that start with 224 and above, minus a little block at the end, that's reserved. In IPv6, it's anything that starts with FF0, uh, with FF. Right. Now, multicast is radically different from everything we've seen in IP because an IP multicast address is a logical identifier. It's the identifier of a group. It doesn't say anything on where the members of the group are. The members of the group are essentially the listeners. So listen means receive here. So if we want to be strict in the terminology, the multicast server is whoever watches TV and not the machine that is sending. How does it work? Well, in this slide, we have everything. So here I'm assuming I have S that is trying to send multicast data, and I have A and B that may want to receive, and I have a 
network of routers with uh, four routers that are labeled one to five. Then the first thing to observe is that the source will simply send one single packet for n destinations. And sending is simply done the, the usual way you've done with uh, uh, in the lab programming exercise. You send, and the only thing that makes it multicast is the choice of the destination address. In, in sockets, you need also, you cannot simply write a destination address. You need also to uh, use a socket option to decide to instruct the operating system that this multicast address is not an error, but is really meant to be multicast. Why? Well, because as we will see, there is some work to do for the system to deliver multicast data. So if S is sending to a multicast address, it just sends, and the router, if the router supports multicast, will receive this packet. We'll analyze the, the IP destination address. We'll say, oh, this is a multicast address. It's recognized by the address itself. If no one in the world is listening to this, then the packet is dropped. So having somebody listening to this multicast address is in fact not something that you signal directly to S, but something that the network knows, the network of IP routers know. Assume now somebody like A wants to listen to this multicast group, wants to receive the data. Then the receiver has to do actively something by using a protocol that is called IGMP. In IPv4, it's a protocol of its own. In IPv6, it's part of ICMPv6. So IGMP means Internet Group Multicast uh, Management Protocol. IPv6 has another name. It's called MLD, Multicast Listener Discovery, not Discovery C. And so we, if we're not interested in the details, what it means is your operating system you will need, if you write a socket program that wants to listen, you will need to instruct the uh, socket uh, that you want to listen. And this will cause the operating system to cause an IGMP message to whoever is a multicast capable router in the lab. This message is like an ARP message, is sent only locally. It's not an ARP message, but follows the same rule. It is sent only on your local air network and is sent to whoever is a multicast capable router. Now, router R1 receives this, and here starts the complexity. R1 will need to start building a distribution tree. We will not see the <laughs> protocols for building distribution trees, at least not now. But as we have seen in the internet, there must be routing tables that are built for knowing how to go to, for packets. So here, what's a simple way of building the tree consists of saying, oh, this guy is listening to a group. If I know where the source of the group is, depending on the flavor of IGMP, if you use one flavor of IGMP, which is called source-specific multicast, you know where S is, then what the router will do is we'll start building a distribution tree by sending a control packet towards S. The control packet is not sent to S, but it's sent towards S. So it will go from R1 to R2. Why to R2? Because R2 is on the path to S. And from R2 to R5. This way of building the tree is called reverse path forwarding. So we... Now, the red rectangle in the router means the, the routers keep state information. The routers remember this group M needs to be forwarded along the links that are marked in green. So compared to the job of a router that we saw before, that's a new function. For every logical group M, you need to keep an information of, about the tree. What are the links around this router that on which you need to forward anything that goes for M. So if everything works well, after a few seconds after A has joined, the three routers have built the tree, and now the next time S sends a packet, when it reaches router R5, R5 looks in the table and says, oh, packet with destination M should be forwarded to R2. And R2 will do the same, packet with destination M should be forwarded to R1. Then R1 receives this packet, puts it on its local area network, and we will see how this is done in the local area network, and then A will receive the packet. 
So far, it's not a very exciting example. We have only one destination, so it's not yet multicast. The interesting stuff is when someone else joins. I'm showing here two destinations, but multicast has been really done with the assumption that there would be millions or even billions of destinations. So here, B joins a few seconds after A. The system at B sends an IGMP message to R4. R what do R4 do? Well, R4 will now try to reach uh, the destination S by sending, so keeping some state information, saying, oh, now if I receive a packet with destination M, I have to put it on the LAN where B is. Then it will talk to R2. And in R2, now R2 knows it is already on the distribution tree of M. Therefore, the thing will stop there. R2 will remember, will put a second rectangle, a red rectangle that says, now if I receive a packet with destination M, I have to duplicate it. I have to send on two links. Each of those rectangles could represent a link. And that's the end of it. And that's why multicast is efficient, because by do after you have a multicast group that has millions of receivers, whenever someone else joins, then it will join the nearest router, and ver with very high probability, this nearest router already receives the information. So we keep the management of receivers close to the receivers. Now when S, after this happens, sends a packet, the packet is processed by R5, R5 looks at its table and says, I should send it to R2. R2 looks at its table, and now it says, I should send it both to R1 and to R4. That's new compared to uh, what we do in, uh, in unicast forwarding. So here, we forward it twice, which means it's the router that does the duplication of packet. And then the two packets will be sent on the two lands, and A and B are happy, and they can watch the football match together. Why is that more efficient than using servers? Because maybe the server is a third party, and here uh, you only have a, you only have a, uh, you have a, yeah, a network. Yes, because the server is a third party. That's the end-to-end -end principle that we've seen already. We want to avoid store and forward. So instead of having a video stream that is stored somewhere, here we do it only at the packet level. But there's another reason. I mean, here, assume every router, uh, of course, the router has more work to do. It has to duplicate packets. But assume every router duplicates 10 times. And assume we build a tree of distribution where we have a depth of tree of 10. Right? At the end, we reach 10 to the power 10. Uh, so uh, four, uh, 10 billion, so 10 billion receivers. So by duplicating a packet, if you, this is this epidemic phenomenon, if you duplicate a packet a small number of times, but everybody does it, so a number of routers do it, at the end you have a huge number of packets that are distributed. So that's the key idea. Multicast is based on the idea that we use the routers already, and each of them needs to duplicate at most by the number of links it has. So if a router that is a very complex router has 100 neighbors, which is already a lot, you will need to duplicate a packet 100 times, not more. Compared to a Netflix server that serves 10 million customers and needs to handle those millions of HTTP requests for files that come from. So that's the, the key idea. How does it work at the Mac layer? Well, first, how do we, we said, we saw that the router forwards the multicast packet to the destination. Now, is it using ARP? The answer is no, there is no ARP. Instead, there is an algorithmic uh, mapping. First, there are MAC layer multicast addresses. And second, how do we map the IP layer destination address to a MAC layer destination address? Well, using this hack here, which essentially means we take the end of the IP destination address and we populate the 24 or 23 or 32, depending on the, whether it's IPv4 or IPv6, we populate the end of the MAC address. So there is a prefix for IPv4 multicast, another one for IPv6 multicast. And for example, if this is the IP destination address, this will be mathematically, algorithmically mapped to this MAC address. And then the MAC layer hardware, the Wi-Fi or Ethernet adapter, 
isn't, knows whether it has to copy all the packets that come to this address because it has been informed by the operating system that there is an application that's listening on this MAC address. Of course, there might be collisions. There might be several groups because we take only, we don't take the complete IP destination address, but only the uh, least significant <coughs> bits. Uh, there might be collision, but the hope is that this is a rare, uh, rare thing. How do the local area networks handle multicasts? Well, it depends. Sometimes they don't. EPFL, Wi-Fi does not. You try IP layer multicast, it's immediately blocked uh, at the source. Uh, most switches that people have at home, like you and I and me, perhaps, <coughs> are non-smart switches. What they do is they simply transform multicast. They handle multicast as if they would be broadcast. Right. It's non-smart, but it is... Uh, Simple, that's why those switches are very simple. And at home, you don't expect to have uh, 10,000 people connected to your network like you have at EPFL, so perhaps that's good enough. Which means that if, for example, uh, there are B and C that listen to a given multicast address, then the printer will receive those packets. But of course, the Mac layer printer's hardware will discard them immediately. If you have a smart switch, it will do the equivalent of a routing protocol. It will build a distribution tree to forward uh, the multicast packets only to where it can. But this is very tricky to do because there is no multicast protocol at the MAC layer. There is no concept of IGMP. What we would need is to that at the MAC layer, an Ethernet host would say, I want to receive the data that correspond to this MAC layer address. There's no protocol for that and we don't want to do a protocol for that. So what is done typically in the so-called smart switches, they listen to the IGMP uh, packets. So we have here a violation of our layering principle. One more, we'll see. We've seen the NATs already. We'll see other ones soon. Um, a, smart, a switch, in principle, looks only at Ethernet headers. Here, this switch will look for IGMP packets. It's easy to do. We, with Wireshark, you see all the IGMP packets. So if you can do it on the screen with Wireshark, a switch can do it also. So you can program the switch to do it. So it will listen to all the IGMP packets. By listening to that, it knows if there is a listener here or there. And then it can use its own uh, tree building algorithm, which is the equivalent of a routing uh, protocol, in order to deliver things only to places where it has to be delivered. So if you have a smart switch, your printer will not receive your Swisscom video. But if you have a non-smart, it will, as illustrated here. As I mentioned, this means that there is a third principle for IP. We saw the two principles of IP, but there is a third one, which is different for multicast, which essentially means that we go from, ex from longest prefix match to exact match. In particular, a router needs to have a separate way of handling the routing table for multicast and for unicast. If we do IP config or if config or netstat, we will see everything in the same routing table, typically. But for big routers, typically, you will handle them separately because the processing is different. When we have a destination address, if it is unicast, we do longest prefix match. If it's multicast, you do exact matching. So you look for exactly a table, for example, this table here that says anything that has multicast address M1 should go exactly to port 3 because, as we've seen before, the routing protocol has enabled this port on the distribution tree. The downside of it is that multicast uh, addresses cannot be aggregated. One of the key benefits of doing longest prefix match is that we can aggregate. Once I have a prefix, for example, like EPFL, somewhere in, the Swiss, in a Swiss network, all the packets that go to EPFL, 128, 178-15, I can send them with one line in my routing table to the correct EPFL. 
once I am inside EPFL, I need longer, more details, but outside I don't. So I can aggregate all the subnetworks of EPFL as one prefix for the rest of the world. And we have seen that with IPv6, we can even do more. With IPv6, we can aggregate all the prefixes of all the Swiss universities as one single prefix for the rest of the world. That's the key idea of uh, the internet layer and how to handle the complexity. For multicast, it breaks. For multicast, it doesn't work because those are logical groups. Where they are depends only on where people are listening. So there might be somebody listening to a stupid French series somewhere in California because there's a French guy who was exiled there. Uh, so you have no topological information and there's no way to aggregate it. So they are really logical identifiers, like MAC addresses in, in some sense. Okay. This is why, in practice, multicast is not supported globally. So if you want to distribute video over the global internet, you cannot do that with multicast because the different operators don't trust each other to support multicast well because everybody is afraid that they will be flooded by routing tables that could become large and they don't want to, to handle that. Typically, we have that inside distribution networks, inside uh, operator network. So Swisscom, Orange, all the large uh, providers support multicast, but they support multicast only for their multicast streaming servers. If you, you try to run multicast, uh, with your machine, uh, it might not work. And certainly, it won't go, it won't cross the boundary of the, of the network. So if you try from EPFL to send multicast to Swisscom, the boundary between Swisscom and EPFL will not accept the, the multicast uh, packets. We use it typically in uh, smart grid networks, for example, or in some corporate networks when we flood, I mentioned the example of an airport where you send uh, the st flight information to 1,000 displays well, is the same thing you're sending to 1,000 displays, so obviously you send it in multicast. Same thing in the smart grid. If you have uh, PMUs or uh, measuring equipment that sense the uh, electrical state of part of the network, and a number of devices want to read this. Uh, some devices that are doing some protection, others that are doing statistics, a SCADA for monitoring everything. So instead of having your device sent to all the listeners, you send to a multicast address. So the multicast is somehow a mixed story. It is used typically in networks where you trust everyone, so typically corporate networks. So it is still good. Multicast is good for sources. If you send, you send only once. So for video servers, then it you don't need a high-performance video server, you just need a reliable one. The same thing, for that's why it's used in uh, industrial networks, is that the industrial sensors are usually very simple equipment. You keep them as simple as possible by sending only once. Last, multicast works, f as we discussed, for UDP, but not TCP. So if you send uh, with multicast, you have to send uh, using UDP, which means if you're distributing data with multicast, uh, you would have a reliability problem. Most of the time, today, if you send multicast, you don't implement something like TCP, you don't implement a reliable protocol. For example, if you send TV information, it's like over terrestrial digital TV, once in a while, you can have a transmission error. You will see a flu, a green blocks on your screen, but the next frame, it disappears. So that's exactly the typical use of multicast. If you want reliability, there, there has been a lot of active research. So there are so-called reliable transport uh, protocol for multicast. But they have to solve the feedback implosion uh, system. So all of these protocols use read solomon codes or variants of read solomon codes where with TCP, if I send a number of packets and one is missing, I will repeat the missing packet. With multicast, if I send a number of packets and assume I have a feedback implosion mechanism where someone says to me something is missing, what should you do? 
Well, you don't know which one is missing. Plus, since the network is large, if you have one million receivers, the one million guys may each miss a different packet. Perhaps not each, but there might be, not everyone would have the, the same packet missing. So if you have codes that are able to repair losses, different losses with the same packet, you will do that. So instead of repeating a packet that you've sent already, you will send a parity, for example, or an extended parity, a read Solomon, uh, using read Solomon coding or fountain codes, you will re resend a block of data that is able to repair uh, the loss wherever the loss would be. So this, here we have Amin Chokrolai of EPFL that has been famous for developing the fountain codes that do exactly that. However, this is very smart and very beautiful, but it's not yet fully implemented in the internet. Voila, we conclude with the last quiz to keep you fit for tomorrow. That's an easy one, so there's no, no head scratching for this one. I close in five seconds. B and C, in order to receive from a multicast group, a system must first join the group with IGMP, that's correct, so this is true. In order to send, no, you don't need to inform the network. Perhaps you need to inform your operating system, um, but in some cases even not. And we can simply, by looking at the IP address, know whether this is true. So this is the correct answer. And the last quiz, yeah. We've seen that already. But we have not looked at the MAC address. So that might be familiar, perhaps painfully so. This is the, one of the ugliness of IPv6. This is the solicited node multicast address. In IPv6, there's no broadcast. Broadcast is forbidden, it's taboo. So anything is replaced by multicast. We send broadcast in a network when we want to reach people who might do a service for us. It's service discovery. For example, with ARP, we broadcast because we don't know who has uh, this MAC address, who has the, uh, we, we don't know the MAC address of who has this IP address. Broadcast is also used, for example, by Apple Talk extensively to discover a printer. You ask, you send a packet to everyone asking who is a printer. But instead of sending a broadcast packet to anyone, you can send it to a multicast address that is reserved for printers, for example. So it is smarter to have a MAC address for routers, printers, DNS servers, things of the like. So that's everything. This is systematically done in this way in IPv6. And in particular here, instead of sending a broadcast for doing ARP, we send it to the solicited node multicast address. And now the question is, if we look at the MAC address, that is in this, uh, uh, this is a variant of Wireshark. Here is the, the MAC address, right, here. The destination MAC address, what is it? I close in five seconds. Well, it's hard to guess, of course. Uh, for IPv6, you take the last 32 bits. For IPv4, you take the last 23. Don't ask me why. This is how things are. But the important thing is, it is algorithmically derived. Voila, we conclude here. See you tomorrow at 11.15.